Well, hello. Welcome to One Man's Faith today. My name is Neil Owen. Glad to have you with me, and we're just going to look at what God's Word has to say. And we've been studying in uh, Galatians, so we will kind of continue on. And I say that because we've taken a little side spur there as we're looking at uh, areas of influence that we have over and they have over us. That will become clearer in just a little while. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. We were using uh, Galatians chapter 3 as, as our starting point. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And we were looking at the, uh, the idea that we've kind of had a glaze put over our eyes. We've accepted the, I, I call it the fallacy, that everything's got to go wrong. As I sometimes say, the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket, okay? You know, we think that. We say, oh, the end is coming. Things have to go the way they're going. Well, no, they don't. And we've looked at this before, but God has put us in the position of being able to pray and change things. So as long as we're on the earth, Christians that is, we can change things. Because he says, if you pray and believe, you will receive. Ask, and I will give it to you. These are all promises that God has given us, and so he's not going to take his promises back. And we can look at Abraham when um, God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, well, God, if there are 50 righteous, he said, Abraham said, it's not like you to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Will you destroy them if there's 50 righteous? And God said, no, I will not. And, and Abraham said, well, if I can find 40, God said, no, I will not, I will not destroy them. And Abraham got him down to, and it was, it was kind of like, God, please don't, please don't hurt me, but if I can find 10. And God said, if you can find 10 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will not destroy them. And so that whole uh, conversation indicates that God is not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. As a matter of fact, they went down and they only found three, four, four people and really one of them only left because she was the wife of, of Lot who was considered a righteous man. And God took them out of the city before he destroyed the city. So we can see that the, uh, what's the word I want? The, uh, the destiny of the righteous is not set with the destiny of the wicked. And so God is going to have to pull out the church, those that are righteous, the, those that are called Christians, really before, I believe, he can destroy or bring, as, as I was talking earlier to somebody about Armageddon. You know, yes, we are headed toward an end time for what we now know as the earth as it is. Because God is headed toward a kingdom that his son is going to rule over. And we call it affectionately the kingdom of God. He is sitting at the right hand of God waiting for the time when only the Father knows that he will say, okay, now is the time. But we also have things that are in place that need to occur really before we can have that battle called Armageddon. Uh, 
and I don't, uh, I'm, uh, I don't even know how I got on this rabbit trail, but I wasn't set up to go into it. But there are certain things. Egypt has to become a desolation. Damascus has to be basically obliterated. There has to be a seven-year peace treaty set up. All these things have to happen before we can even get to the Battle of Armageddon, which will happen seven years after that peace treaty. So there, there are things that have to happen. Uh, write me if you would like to know more about that, and and I'll we'll do a we'll do a series on that. And there's there's the email address kermanoid at gmail .com. Very easy. Uh, but just let me know, uh, uh, and I'll be glad to 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 set it up and even answer your questions that you may have. So email me, give me the questions, and say yes. Neil, do a series on 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 the end times, and I'll you know and I'll th and I'll throw that in maybe after I finish here with the, with Galatians. But I got there because we, the church, have been put under a spell. We think that things have to go to hell in a handbasket. We think that because we we're being taught, well, the world the the Bible shows that the world is going to go down, 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 down. Well, yes and no. That's not totally true. But I'm going, I got to watch out because it looks like I'm going to head back into that. But we have been bewitched or put under a spell in different areas. And we started to look at these. They're, I, I've called them, and they've been called the seven mountain mandate or the seven cultural areas of influence. Um, there is, there is religion, the family, education, government, the media, arts and entertainment, and business, okay? Our areas are influenced by all seven of those, and we can have influence into those seven. And what has happened is the Christian church has said, well, things have got to go bad. You know, there's... Why, why get involved? Well, there's a good reason to get involved. And that is to have an influence in those areas. Because it's, uh, I think I used this uh, analogy with you. There's a parable that uh, talks about, I was trying to find it real quick. Uh, yes, in Luke 11. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I will return. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. If we don't have an influence, then we are allowing that area to continue on a downhill tread when we can have an influence. But we've got to do more than influence it by saying, it's got to be set a certain way. We have got to input into that so that it changes and, and is not left open for another outside influence to come in. And one of the, one of the um, uh, examples I gave was welfare. If the church would do what the church was supposed to have done, we wouldn't have a welfare system. You see, God mandated the church to take care of the widows, the orphans, and, and the poor. And Pat Robertson said back in the early 70s, he said, if every church would take care of 10 needy people, there would be no need for welfare. Well, we didn't. We did not take the mandate. We did not take the mantle of that and run with it. And because of that, the government stepped in heavily, and now we have a system where you can make more money not working than you can working. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. It's wrong. We've, we've created a welfare mentality where people think that they're entitled 
to anything and everything they want. And that the government will, the government will take care of them. Well, the government's going to take care of you for a while, but while it's taking care of you, it's got you under its thumb. I know I, I had a friend who uh, was talking about going on disability. I said, don't do it. I said, it's going to limit you. And he came back to me later and he said, Neil, you're right. I should not have gone on, dis gone on disability because the government says, okay, you're going on disability, but you can only make this much money. If you make any, more, any other money, we're going to take it. And that's not right. But the church should have stepped in. And that's just one area in which, you know, the church said, you know, the poor need help. But we allowed the government to come in and provide the help. And with that, I got to take a break. So let's go ahead and take that break, and I'll be right back.